we got up yesterday morning to better weather, which is to say it's 600 foot overcast and one or two miles visibility. It was great flying weather for the GAAA. So we made the satellite call into uh, Arctic Radio and they gave us you know, a pretty good report for Baker Lake and uh, loaded up the planes and, and off we went. And what in essence happened is our timing I think was about as bad as it could have been because as we approached Baker Lake, the crosswind increased dramatically, the barometric pressure went down dramatically, the visibility went down, the clouds came down, and the rain started to fall. And really from an aviation standpoint, I think we arrived at Baker Lake at Frontal Passage. So we flew over Baker Lake, and there's big swells in Baker Lake, no chance of landing a seaplane there. So we went to over to Airplane Lake, which is a mile or two from town, which is designated on the Canadian Water Air Dome as the seaplane landing spot. It's called Airplane Lake. Now, we have a bone to pick with the guys that named it Airplane Lake because it was not airplane friendly. Nothing about it was airplane friendly. And uh, when we arrived, uh, I'm, I'm going to say the winds were well into the 30 knot category, 35 knots, maybe I'm sure there were gusts over 40. It was raining. This lake is only three quarters of a mile long and there were oh I don't know two two and a half foot rollers and white cap. Came in and as I flared about 20 feet over um, the turbulence was was I mean the winds were way I think way over 30 knots and the turbulence was and I was using full control deflections to keep it level. And, and I'm thinking, and it's still in the back of your mind, is, is this, you know, is this it? <laughs> is this the one that's... <laughs> but then, you know, one of the great things about you, closer to the, to the water, you get kind of in a ground effect, and things kind of level out, and you touch down. And uh, things were, uh, we were down, you know. And, and you think you have this big sigh of relief, now it's over. But it wasn't. But uh, a lot of times when you land a float plane, as we, as we found out yesterday, uh, that's when the adventure begins, is after you land. And it was a wild affair. Uh, and one of the problems that you run into uh, in a situation like that is it's very difficult and can be dangerous to turn from downwind, from upwind to downwind, because that, that airplane acts as a weather vane on the water and it, it wants to cock right into the wind. And when the wind's blowing hard, it wants to stay that way. And anytime you move that airplane to one side or the other, it, it wants to weather vane back in. And if you try to force it around and you get crosswind and you catch a a roller and a gust at the same time, it's very possible to roll an airplane. Meanwhile, we're, we, we decided we're going to have to sail down the lake, which is to say that you should cut the engine and you just let the wind push you. And you have marginal control of which direction. You have a little bit of control, but not a lot. So uh, we cut the engine, and that was a great idea for about three seconds until we hit a rock. And, we had boom, we had the boom, hit a rock. Yeah. So we fire the engine up and now we're, now we're worried about the wind, the waves, and we're watching both float to make sure one isn't sinking. And of course, when you've got two plus foot rollers and white caps, when you set that airplane down uh, and you just come up to the beach and those rollers are coming in, it'll sit there and bounce. And if it's the wrong kind of bottom, rocky bottom and with all these uh, sharp rocks, you just, you just grind your floats into a pulp. You'll just shred them up in no time. And about, what would you say, Jim, maybe 200 feet from the beach, we dropped an anchor with a long line and we began to, with power, me working the, 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 the power and Jim working this long line behind the prop uh, area there, because the prop was still moving, we slowly let the plane drift back towards this beach. And when we got to the point where we could jump in the water, we latched the anchor and we hoped that it would set. And I saw Doug still struggling to try to get the yeah. boat, his plane down. You know, literally, or honestly, I would not have been surprised to look up and see his plane upside down. We would power and go to the left end of the lake, and then the wind would push it back to the right. And we zigzag back and forth until we got to the back end of the lake, near where Mark and company was, who by that time had his plane anchored and was, you know, semi-in-control. 
And Mark, just, you know, an amazing guy. He just, he jumped in the water again with Jim Clark. And uh, the two of them set an anchor for us uh, out in Chest High. And this was, wind was blowing, it was raining. And by this time, my hands are so cold that I can't really do much with them. They're like clubs. Right. You know, you can kind of grip something. Those guys set an anchor for us and got us anchored. And I mean, I, I will be forever grateful to Mark for that. And, and, you know, he and I shared a teary moment last night talking about it. I, I just went in and I said, Mark, you know, you've just been fantastic. And you've done everything that I'd hoped you would bring to this. He was a hero to me. You know, he just jumped in and, and suffered near hypothermia. And the reason, I don't want to overstate that, but I came into town to get the vehicle. When I went back, we were talking about rearranging the plane, and Mark says, I need to get back now. And Mark never lets on that he's, you know, experiencing any kind of physical discomfort. But he was cold. Definitely the worst weather and conditions I have ever landed in. But it was... It was a, it was a day.